thanks dear viewers for joining us on this edition of the 6 p.m prime time newscast on Equinox television live from my headquarters in cameroon's economic capital dweller i am babla jonathan in our top stories in this edition of the news the national commission on human rights and freedoms expresses disappointment over president paul b.s failure to answer directly to recommendations they have sent the commission has sent to him on the deepening anglophone crisis the commission is demanding the permission of the president of the republic paul Bia, to champion the efforts to end the socio-political and security crisis in the northwest and southwest regions of the country it has written an open letter to the head of state paul b and also in this newscast we will show you the deplorable conditions in which some internally displaced persons in the dweller for municipality are living stay with us Cameroon's National Commission on Human Rights and Freedoms demands President Paul Biers accord to champion efforts to end the deepening Anglophone crisis in the northwest and southwest regions of the country. The commission, led by Dr. Chimuta Divine Banda, is expressing disappointment over President Paul Biers' failure to answer directly to uh, recommendations uh, sent to him. And of course, the commission is uh, decrying the deepening situation on the ground details in this report by for me i'm strong sander in an open letter addressed to president paul biar the national commission for human rights and freedoms said it wants to produce an effective and lasting solution to the anglophone crisis acknowledging that human rights concerns have significantly increased in the trouble hit northwest and southwest regions the commission expressed frustration that people are beginning to doubt their willingness to cooperate to end the crisis. They, in their letter signed March the 22nd, 2019, demands the permission and support of President Paul Bia to resolve the crisis, citing four different preoccupying reports sent to the president, which have not received any direct reaction from him. The NCHRF said it wrote to President Paul Bia on the 9th of February 2017 following their observation and investigation mission to the Northwest and Southwest regions. The Commission further presented their contribution to a way out of the crisis in the trouble hit Northwest and Southwest regions on the 18th of June 2018 address another message through the secretary general at the presidency of the republic to the head of state on the 14th of january 2019 the last in a series of their concerns addressed to president paul bia was on the 18th of february 2019 concerning the deteriorating socio-political and security situation in cameroon and the consequences on the fundamental rights of the population presenting itself as the right body to champion the possible return to normalcy in the two English-speaking regions of Cameroon. The National Commission for Human Rights and Freedoms explained the role it played in the safe release of some 200 students recently kidnapped from the University of Boya. The students, according to the National Commission for Human Rights and Freedom, were released thanks to the mediation of its Southwest Regional Delegate. The Commission further reminded President Paul Bia that the professional, intellectual, philosophical and religious mix of the persons at this National Human Rights Institution that President Paul Bia put in place is such that may raise his attention to advice and recommendations on matters of human rights in Cameroon. And as the crisis continues deepening further, hundreds of thousands of persons displaced by the Anglophone a crisis continue equally living in precarious and even deadly conditions. Last weekend, we reported here on Ekinos Television the story, the sad story of a woman, Rebecca Nje, who was in a critical condition at the Boya Regional Hospital begging for uh, help. Her 
treatment was suspended due to uh, financial constraints. She is no more. She has died of the uh, stroke that she suffered in the bush when she escaped her home into the bush as a result of the ongoing violence. And many are living in such conditions in parts of the country. And the report coming up next, we're going to talk about the situation of some of them who are in Bonaberry, Dwala for municipality. Among them, an internally displaced parent of the Anglophone crisis who is now lamenting over the situation of a sickle cell uh, child and the child is uh, gradually uh, moving uh, away from her as a result of uh, his, the ill health of that child. Details in this report by Ino Senazi. I'm not comfortable with my life at all, at all. These are internally displaced persons of the Anglophone crisis. The family of four children, with one, a Sikla from Kumba, now seeks refuge in Bonaberry in the Dwala 4 subdivision. I am here with my four children. One is an SS. Medically, it is not easy. I'm even preparing the herbs to give him to drink. And educationally, they are in school. I have not been able to pay the school fees. I only go there and beg. At times, I'll give 5000 like that. Up to today, I have not been able to pay the fee. Here, they live an unexpected life as the armed conflicts in Kumba, southwest region, killed the little courage they had to move on with their sustaining activities. Why I was in Kumba, it was not really easy. Because some of us were like Pokusala, for example. We have to run inside the bush. And inside the bush, it was not really easy because as a woman, during menstruation, people will go under the cocoa, there's a leaf there that they will take to use as part. And we, people will live under the mango tree, put mattresses on the, on the ground to sleep. Medically, people were just sick. At times, people will, or even have ratchets over the body. It was not really easy for us there. Her sick son braved her to leave the forest back to Kumba to battle amid insecurity for their upkeep. I thought of all these things and I said, let me go to Kumba and also educational problems. So I came to Kumba also. There was no means in Kumba. Things were not like that as before because I had a bookshop, but there was nothing going. I had a business I was doing there. Things were just, I said, oh, let me come to Dwala. In Dwala, life has not been friendly with her since she is a male stranger. I had to live from hand to mouth. Where I'm even living is not where I've, I've ever lived before. So... I can see the life is not, it is baffling me, it is dealing with me. And as far as food is concerned, it's not also easy because here in Dwala you buy everything, even if it is water you have to buy, leaves you even have to buy as compared to when I was down there in Southwest. A frustrating life which has however not prevented God's mercy. At times there are friends that will even say take this 5,000, this one will say I have 2,000, this one will say I have a bag of rice, this one will say I have Maggie. The life is what I've never lived. So it is like I'm just looking at it as a dream in my life. I'm just looking at it as a dream. She has lost her business, loan income generating source in the war zone. In my house, even when you look at the house, nothing to show. We just live there. It is, I cannot even say, I am just tired of all this. I'm tired. My life is not really comfortable. And the children also to go to school. This is a place that they have never been. They will trek at times, they come back. In short, we just live from hand to mouth, hand to mouth, hand to mouth like that. Since I came here from June up to now, I have nothing that I'm doing. Her prayer is that God should sustain her sickle cell son. With hope, things return to normalcy in her town, Kumba in particular. Then, the northwest and southwest regions. He's living by just true herbs. If he falls sick today, how am I going to do in the hospital? And the Social Democratic Front, SDF, political party of John Frundi has continued pressing for a return to normalcy in the two Anglophone regions of the country. This has been a major concern of the party over close to three years today. At the National Assembly as well as the Senate, the members of Parliament and Senators of the Social Democratic Front have been pressing for the Parliament to put this issue on the agenda as a matter of urgency. 
efficiency in view of finding solutions to the deepening socio-political and security crisis. And this was, of course, one of the issues that were uh, on the discussion table during the last National Executive Committee meeting of the SDF in the nation's political capital, Yaoundi, and the members of the Social Democratic Front, the officials, also discussed the upcoming municipal legislative and regional elections. Here's an extract of the uh, Social Democratic Front, a member of Parliament, Honorable Joseph Bandam. Take a listen. Saying that SDF is going to boycott, or SDF is going to attend. Because if no, we are boycott, taking a decision in convention that will not boycott any election. But when the circumstances are impossible, what do you do? That is why we keep thinking that we must call on this government to make sure that the conditions are conducive for holding an election. Yeah, um, we are a political party and we will never relent our efforts. We are having two regions of this country that are under war and people are being killed on a daily basis. We have to make sure that we continue to push this government to, to, to bring about peace. And if it thinks that it can continue to move over the blood of people, that is a different uh, issue. But as coming out of this neck, we think that we should continue to impress on this government, on the beer government, to find definitive solutions to the crisis in the northwest and southwest regions. Honorable Joseph Banda, member of Cameroon's lower house of parliament from the Social Democratic Front, speaking there. And as a result of the crisis hitting some countries of the Central African uh, sub region, notably the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as the issue of Boko Haram in the Lake Chad uh, Basin, officials from these uh, countries are meeting here in the economic capital, Douala, and they are discussing uh, strategies on how to. Uh, um, for the uh, help the governments of the different countries to solve uh, the crisis in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, in the Central African Republic, as well as in the Lake Chad uh, Basin, the uh, notably civil society organizations who are meeting under the auspices of the economic uh, community of Central African uh, states, and they are discussing strategies on how to boost the capacity of civil society organizations in the uh, commitment towards the prevention of crisis as well as resolution of crisis in these countries. We will be coming back to this in greater details in the second part of this newscast. Now we are going to talk about some uh, aid workers who are news out of the country. Aid workers are struggling to reach survivors of Cyclone Idai and some 2 million people leave, uh, some 2 million people's lives have been affected by the tropical storm which hit Mozambique before moving inland to Zimbabwe and Malawi. Kurt C. Euronews. Aid workers in Zimbabwe prepare burials for victims of last week's devastating cyclone. As supplies for survivors are helicoptered in, the known death toll from the disaster is more than 700, with aid agencies saying the final total will be well over a thousand. Some two million people's lives have been touched by Cyclone Idai, which hit Mozambique before moving inland to Zimbabwe and Malawi bringing devastation first with winds of 170 kilometers per hour and then with flooding that followed. The focus now is on bringing food to survivors and on preventing the spread of cholera and other waterborne diseases. The government of Mozambique says it's already set up treatment centers in anticipation of any such outbreak. Twitter users have rallied to the cause of three school girls arrested for defacing photos of Burundian uh, President Pierre Kuruziza by following the uh, example and crudely uh, doctored uh, images of the leader uh, being circulated online under the hashtag Free Our Girls and the girls were charged last week with insulting the head of state and could spend up to five years in prison. 
reason, Burundian authorities are routinely accused of cracking down on human rights and descent. And the schoolgirls aged 15, 16, and 17 were arrested two weeks ago after the president's image was defaced in textbooks for other students arrested together with them were later released. And now in sports, Manji Kangebre presents a roundup of the teams uh, that have qualified so far for the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations Bill for Egypt. The goal from Cedric Amisi of Burundi landed the Itamba Murugamba boys into history as they picked up their qualification for the African Nations Cup 2019. Blows the whistle and Burundi have qualified for the Africa Cup of Nations. Burundi, that has never qualified for an African Nations tournament, joined others like Madagascar and Mauritania to create sensation and will be appearing at the Continental Showpiece event next June 2019. Namibia was another team that qualified by luck after the defeat in the hands of Zambia. They had to wait for the results of the other group match to be sure of their qualification. Surprisingly enough, Burkina Faso, that finished third in the 2017 edition, won't be part of the tournament this year. Apart from the surprises, we have the return of the Super Eagles of Nigeria to the tournament. and also Tanzania after making their last appearance in 1980. Cameroon, who are the defending champions, will have to go head-to-head -head with other top African nations in their quest to keep the trophy. The draw for the group stage of the tournament comes up on April 19, 2019, while the tournament will run from June 21 to July 19, 2019 in Egypt. The final score, Niger won, Egypt won. That's it for the first part of this edition of the news. Coming up next, Talking Point. Thanks for joining us in Talking Point. We are receiving Ambassador Hamuli Kabaz Kabaruza. Is that? That's right. All right, you are the Director of Political Affairs of the Economic Community of Central African States and your department is in charge of working with civil society organizations. You have assembled a good number of them from the different Central African countries here in Douala today, the purpose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have started our, our workshop today. It's a training workshop for uh, civil society organizations of all the 11 member countries of ICAS. Uh, and we are exploring ways of facilitating civil society to participate in, in conflict resolution uh, in our region. All right. What are some of the challenges that civil society organizations within the Central African sub-region are facing in the discharge of their duties, notably in the areas of conflict prevention and conflict resolution? Well, I, I think the first um, challenge is the um, we capacity to analyze conflicts. I think the, the, the problem is that uh, uh, civil society should be trained in conflict analysis uh, because if they are not well trained, not well informed, then of course their capacity of uh, uh, contributing to the solution is weak. So one thing is training, 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 reinforcing the capacity of civil society to deal with conflicts. That's one. Second, of course, uh, civil society has to also reinforce its own capacity to dialogue with the government, to guard dialogue with all stakeholders uh, in a resolution of a conflict. Mm. What um, are some of the issues that are um, uh, kind of hindering them from uh, enhancing their capacity to dialogue with government? Well, they have internal, of course, internal uh, uh, problems like you know capacity organization the way they are organized the the way they are funded um, 
the the the, the way they are uh, institutionally based, like you know, infrastructure, you know, etc. Uh, yeah, in fact, in Central Africa, uh, we have a very vibrant civil society that is now growing up and and getting stronger. But in terms of working in conflict, uh, we still have to go. We has we still have to to, to support uh, civil society very much. That's why we are having. We're starting now different uh, meetings, uh, different workshops uh, to allow civil society to be able to work as professionals in uh, early warning, uh, in terms of you know early warning for conflicts, uh, participating in mediation efforts, or uh, participating in uh, in uh, implementation of, implementation of uh, of agreements or whatever. So there is a need to reinforce their capacity in those fields. Now, uh, apart from um, organizational challenges that uh, are somehow hindering them from uh, communicating, uh, partnering effectively with government authorities, uh, what about uh, financial and uh, human resource constraints? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the problem is that uh, many civil society organizations have been seen as being funded from outside. And as people say, you who blow the pipe <laughs> dictates, blow the the dictates the tune. So the problem is that uh, they have been seen as uh, expressing, um, uh, say, policies of foreign partners, which is not a good, a good, a good it, is, it is not a good image, of course. So we have to move away from that image. Mm. Uh, First of all, we have to know that since the 80s now, this region, Central Africa, has seen growing local organizations in all different fields. And these organizations are in fact citizens of our countries uh, who have decided to give a chance to government policies by initiating uh, all sorts of actions to bring contribution of the people. And th this has been policies of governments in the region to encourage the people to take responsibilities of solving their own problems. Not only waiting for the government, but starting already and the government can come as support to these initiatives. And so which this is a very good uh, move because this is, this is what's, what is called ownership which means that through these organizations, people want to own their own, the solution to their own programs, to their own problems, which is excellent indeed. So the problem is, how do we mobilize, first of all, resources on the local ground, on in communities to start with? Because you cannot organize something and say, you know, we are waiting for a foreigner to come with support. Outside. No, you have to start with communities and, and do what they want because community development is about that. It is about uh, organizing people at local level to solve their key problems, the problems uh, which, uh, you know, uh, refrain them for having a better life. So, uh, it is, it is to be encouraged. This move has to be encouraged. Civil society in some countries have been very vibrant and very visible and have been recognized by government policies. They have been supported, etc. In but some other countries, there are, st there, there are still lots of efforts to be done. But what we are doing here, what we are doing is heads of states, heads of states had, have in 2009, uh, head of state decided that civil society should be partners in the peace processes. And as partners? That partners uh, in fighting against, say, violence on women, uh, ignorance, uh, partners in the struggle against poverty, etc. And, as, and, and, and as partners, what are civil society organizations expected to bring in as contributions in efforts to uh, quell down the crisis, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in uh, Central African Republic, and even in the Lake Chad Basin with the Boko Haram issue? 
Well, uh, I'm coming from the uh, Lake Chad Basin, and we were on a mission, on a joint mission, ECOWAS ICAS, and I was able to to go to Kuseri, which is in Cameroon, and I was in Chad, etc. We went to visit local communities where we saw that there women are organized. This is a local, these are local organizations of women uh, which are promo promoting uh, uh, reconciliation in the villages, in the communities, etc. We were able to see local organizations also promoting uh, peace uh, and reconciliation. This is very good. This is a good move. Uh, in uh, Central Africa, civil society in Central Africa has been in all the dialogue processes since uh, 2009. Civil society has been in all the debates, all the forums that were organized for dialogue, for peace in Central Africa. Civil society was there. Uh, I need to remind that Her Excellency Samba Panza was from civil society. But the problem is that... So, um, which so means that civil society have capacity when they have the opportunity to participate. But the problem is that most often the recommendations that are coming from these civil society organizations are hardly uh, considered by the authorities. We have we, we heard in the report the National Commission on Human Rights and Freedoms uh, complaining in an open letter to the President of the Republic that the last four letters that it sent recommendations on the Anglophone crisis, uh, the Commission has received no direct answer from the head of state. Well, <coughs> I am not aware of the develop the recent developments on that issue but from what I know I know the church uh, has been contributing in discussions in, in this country maybe there are other organizations like women organizations uh, in, that are giving contribution so if that one wakes up and say we want to give a chance to, to the peace process and give a hand to the government which is good I think uh, it depends on the authorities to see the capacity of that institution and see how it can contribute. So consider. what I mean, the doors are open in the region because heads of state decided that uh, civil society organizations might be actors. Now they have to show their capacity on these issues. One of the problems that we have, as I said, is the, the capacity to analyze the conflict. You do not say, I, partici I want to participate in solving a problem if you don't have the capacity to do it. So you have to get your own capacity. If you are invited, then you have to start with your own means, your human resources, your resources, your institution, your, your network, and show that you can give a good contribution, not rely immediately on, you know. So what are some it is important to express that will and it is expressed and it is good that it is expressed to the government then it depends on the government to decide who is the partner in this situation because the government is certain it's our authority the government is sovereign. Uh, like situation in DRC for instance which I know very well because I myself from the DRC and we did contribute the civil society in uh, DRC contributed in all the phases of the negotiation of the crisis, the inter-Congolese dialogue, the San Sinti dialogue, civil society was there. Civil society was even given, some leaders were even given responsibility in the transition period. So what are some of the, the tools that you were giving them today to enable them to contribute more in resolving and preventing crisis? Well, in the workshop here, we are um, coming back with the different recommendations that they had in 2007 and 17, that they want to create a network for peace prevention in uh, peace prevention and peace, uh, excuse me, conflict, prevention, prevention conflict, and, conflict and prevention and, and peace mm -hmm. uh, reinforcement in the region. They recommended to have a network, a strong network in the region. Uh, so we are coming back to them to say, well, you propose this in 2017. Now, what what is the problem? Why have you not organized? So we are now discussing with them and see how this network can start immediately. You know, in West Africa, there is a work a, a network which is called WANEP, and it is official. It, it is in partnership with ECOWAS. So in Central Africa, we don't have such a network. So we would be very very happy 
if civil society could develop a network on peace, uh, on peace process, on conflict resolution, on conflict prevention, etc. So right. the early warning mechanism of ICAS will be happy to collaborate and reinforce the capacity of all the net of the organizations that want to work in early warning. This is very, very important. All right, Ambassador Hamuli Kabaruza, Director of Political Affairs of the Economic Community of Central African States. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for today.